Hi, and welcome to another Woodworking Wisdom. So I get to cross over again, back in the wood turning room from last week, doing a bit of hand tool work. This week we're back in here. So what are we going to look at today? Um, gouges. Turning gouges. What, what do they do? What are they? And that's quite a loose description. And this came about because one of you sent us in a couple of pictures and a description and what am I doing wrong? So I kind of went, be a great video. Let's try and focus on where you use those gouges. Have a look at what they are. And as we mainly said, how you use them. Not so much how you sharpen them. We're going to cover lots of different things. You get questions, let me know. All right, so Ben's sent here with the computer bit. He's going to go over that. So we'll see where we get to. Okay, so just going to bring Shai up onto the light bed. Now, I actually, and something happened about a year ago that I will say kind of helped me with what we're going to do this afternoon. I inherited some turning tools. And it's quite nice to have something like that that I've inherited because these tools go back a bit further than actually I think um, I have. So my turning reality, if you like, in the realms of this world is 30, 35, 37 years. So I've got tools now that I'm going to show you that are older than me. And they're a little bit scary, some of these. And you turn with these? Yep. So the first thing I actually had to do was sharpen them. Ben sat here laughing because he knows what's kind of coming. So I'm going to get some of these on. We're going to explain a few of them as we go through. Okay. Um, so I'll bring these over. I've got a mixture. I'm not going to get them all on here, but I just thought it'd be quite nice to bring a few over. Okay. I love this. Look at this. This is like a guitar. All right. Now, okay, so what have we got in here? There is a mixture of newer and some older tools. We've got a few more behind me. Going to really go through those a little bit. What are they? Where do you start? Most of you are new to turning. What tools do you want? First of all, Buy the best tools you can. All right. That's that's a strong statement. I know. I know money's always an issue with lots of people. Am I sure I'm going to enjoy this as a hobby? Try and buy the best tools you can. If you enjoy it, they will pay for themselves time and time again. I've still got some of my original toolkit I ever had. And I think of, you know, I actually bought quite good tools. So I've looked after things. So hopefully if you do that, then things will last. So in here, we've got a couple of really sort of scary things. And it's quite amazing when you look at this. Let's grab one more because I know one more here. Okay. So spindle wrapping gouge is the major thing most of us will probably start with. Okay. We're going to go through these as, as a thing. So this is what we're going to start with. The tray I'll put out the way in a second. So spindle wrapping gouge is the major thing. Now, let's just lose this because I'm worried about knocking it on the floor. It sounds a weird you know, sort of topic, doesn't it? A gouge. You spin the wrapping gouge, and the tools I've got behind me, I learned them in reality, are probably handmade, hand forged. More modern tools, and I'll try and explain as we go through the techniques they've used. With. So, this would have started off as a flat piece of steel. This is high carbon steel, quite quick to grind. If you want to know the difference, if you grind it, this will sharpen quicker. It will hold a sharper edge, but it won't last as long. High-speed steel will hold an edge. You can't sharpen it quite the same, as in sharpness to a tip, but it will last longer, okay? And then there's newer alloys that are coming that we're getting now in 42 and everything else, changing it again a little bit. But this is high-carbon steel. This would have started off as a flat piece of steel and then hand-beaten to this shape, okay? Quite thin section because they've obviously got to heat it, get it to that sort of that section, that shape. More modern techniques, we get a different one off of here. And I don't know if you can see this, the thickness of the steel. This is thicker on the side wing coming up. So a little bit thicker. Why would it be thicker? Modern techniques allow them to bend things quicker. Hydraulic presses and everything else will bend it. Likewise, even the ferrule section or the tang that goes into the handle has a slight curve. So they're bending all of that, which is quite amazing. My older tool we've got on here has flat section quite thick tang and then it's ground out as well so this comes down and then they've ground it so the tang is dead rectangular to sharpen and that's a magic word no matter what you go and get you will need to sharpen this is sharpened to a 45 degree angle so if i just get a pencil it'll hopefully make it easier so the tip comes to about a 45 degree angle across there 
one equal grind all the way around. I do a hollow grind or a flat. So you can use something like the Pro Edge, Tormac, your bench grinder, CBM wheel, but you want something up through here that is one facet all the way up for it. Not lots of little bits. Um, and this is this is something we did a while back. We used these. Ben, can you go to camera two? When we did the curving thing a few weeks back, I explained about the fact of having your bevel underneath your tool. So if we took our chisel and we took a cross section through the middle, where my fingertips are, what are we after? What we don't want is a curve. Great for a carving tool. And this is the piece of wood we use for that to show you. The problem with having that is I've got to bring it right up onto the tip to make it cut. I've got no support in behind on a turning tool because this rocks. So if you've got lots of little faces where you've tried grinding it and you create a curve, it's not going to be effective, not going to work nicely. So you need to have that nice sort of straight grind. So in reality, you've got something more like that, flat or hollow. So it sits on. That gives you a way of making contact, bringing the tip in, moving off to do your cut. All relevant to what we're doing. So whatever tools we've got here, you've got to have that sharpening bit got right. Sadly, when you buy a lot of tools, they're not pre-sharpened. Okay. So going to start by roughening gouge. Um, I have a piece of timber. This is a bit of elm, just something we've got in here that I kind of thought it will rough down quite nicely. We can show you different tools to use for this. We'll explain different tools. I put pro drive, head stock, tail stock. We've got ring center. Let me bring it up. I tight it to there, bring it back just a tiny bit. Pro drive, I can get a tiny bit of pressure. So this has a small spindle that locates out the front of the pro drive, which is spring loaded. So I'm just resting on that spring pressure now. I can check how it's going to spin without even starting the lathe. Got a little bit of pressure, that's good. I can wind it up to make full contact with the teeth on it. Make sure things are locked off nice and tight. Headstock, I've checked the handle out on the back of the headstock because we can swing the head. Want a tool rest, so a robust rest. Let's go into there. Heightways, I'm going to use a roughening gouge. It's primarily work, so our spindle roughening gouge, to give it its full name, is to convert square stock of spindle blank work, which means the grain direction is running parallel to the lathe bed down to a cylinder. It's its most basic form of work. Tool rest height. I'm going to take top edge as a diamond point. The corner on the top of the tail, the tool rest, needs to be about quarter of an inch below that corner. It's going to vary a little bit because your heights of people are going to vary. But as we said in previous things, your lathe needs to be set up so your elbow height is level with the centre point of the lathe. That's quite important. Another thing that might make it vary just very slightly, thickness of the chisel. But nothing too much. Most important thing we're using this is approach to the work. How you tackle this and what's going to happen. So first thing, we've loaded a new piece of wood. It's worth me taking the speed down lower and bring it up gently if I can. Electric variable is fantastic for that. I can gently bring it up. I can listen to what's going on. Ooh, getting a bit of wind now. I brought the speed up quickly. I want to come back just a touch. Okay, that's my running speed I want to be. So that's about 1400 for this. That's good. What happens if you run slower? Okay, let's bring it down. Most people, when they're new to turning, are really a little bit paranoid about how fast the speed should be. We've got 260 RPM on there at the moment. The next thing we're going to do is approach with the chisel. Where do you come with this? Um, you're new to this. It can be very daunting. Most people, because this all seems stronger, they hold the handle really close to their body. Number three, Ben, just a little bit. We'll flick that between two. So you get it all up here, nice and level, up onto the toe rest. It's a night white, white knuckle ride, this. That's absolutely right. So not good. Too tense. Now, the problem with doing what we're doing there, I'm going to put it on. First, we've got low speed. It bounces between the corners. Okay. 
it doesn't it will cut it but i'm dragging a knife edge it bashes the cornered off in reality quite brutal the other problem with running too slow it will drop in between the corners there's an air gap you're pushing in a little bit you drop in so you basically bounce off it doesn't feel friendly so faster speed would be better okay i bring it up we said to about 1400 would be good fingertips i can do next thing i'm going to relax my body a little bit so then let's go back to two i think all right mate. so finger and thumb on here if i want to use this i put the handle down beforehand we're up here all white knuckle ride nice and low i can make contact no shaving nothing happening yet there's my cutting edge lower up next thing that's important with this where you put your feet i deliberately stood sideways so the handle will clear the side of my body i'm not stood right in front of it facing the workpiece my legs either side if anything happens it's more likely to hit me in this position so sideways from there handle down low up find or cut move along work safely off the end and i know this is real basic if i take it off and i lose my angle of approach drop the handle down rest that bevel so we're resting on that ground edge on the back we're gently going to bring it up move off again i'm working from larger to smaller oh. nice and easily as things get smaller i've got to increase the handle height just fractionally so we change our edge again taking it off reposition still got a corner working on a small bit at the moment but i want to use the bits of wood for different cuts now one of my good or bad habits is and there's nothing to stop you doing this i can roll the tool it's a it's a half a pipe in reality i get people say why are you why are you using the side i tend to get a slightly longer cut also I've sharpened all of it. Why not use those ties? So it is possible to use that through your cut. But I can do exactly the same approach. Handle low, gently come up. Really important. That's major priority with this. The minute you try and come in square, it doesn't sound as nice. You're chipping everything. You're bashing the corners off. It's not as controlled. So I'll make a bit more rough cut. This I can get a nice smooth finish. Okay. Other thing I've got, and we kind of joked with it earlier. Uh, where should we go? That's right, Ben. We're good there. All right. This is a what I was class, and I'm just going to flip it around now. A continental gouge. Okay, this is massive. Okay, um, if you do a lot of pole well, like turning or something, green would work. This would be the sort of tool definitely they had years ago to rough their tool or the blanks out to get their chair legs done quickly what we've just been using actually is quite a modern tool this sort of thing has been around for centuries the blacksmith tradition in the village would have made this out of a block of steel hand beating it heated it beat it keep going to get your shape so nothing new about this okay again big wide tang quite long handle okay massive long tool the tools as long as the handle and probably a good two inches wide almost all right so i've sharpened and i said to you about sharpening it is such a priority um and when i got these no they weren't nice and sharp which camera were on there sorry but i'm just trying to see where i am right it's on free i can peel, i can actually cut my pencil with this now again this is high carbon steel if you sharpen high carbon steel on a bench grinder you get lots of bright golden colored sparks quite easily if it's high speed steel, you will get a more orange colored spark, a bronzy color if you like, and they're harder to produce. That's a quick and easy way of knowing. Now, this is what they would have used a couple of hundred years ago, especially these pole turners with that. Okay, so, along. so we can do exactly the same with this. So, tool rest is better, right? This is nice, heavy tool. That's a really good. Now I've got a bit of fingernail shape on this. I'll tell you something, nice weight for this, so 
definitely moved along nice and easily. Okay, just going along. So, yeah, traditional or continental gear, did I would class it. Quite nice to use for this. Got a lot of weight. You see how quick we've roughed that gear on. Moves nice and easily on the Toro, especially this sort of size. Down to a cylinder quickly. Now, next thing, speed. Not that I, you. How quick you want to get this done is quite an important part. Let's put that in practice for you. So first thing, I'm going to move my left foot. I'm trying to describe where my leg is because it's quite an important part that we all seem to forget that where you stand on the lathe is going to affect what you're going to get as a finish. I want to be able to finish with the tool right down near the headstock. But I'm going to start about halfway. From the middle, going to come to me. I've deliberately now moved my body out of the way to give the handle room to here. If I pull my leg back inside the, the lathe stand, I've got to lean backwards here. Doesn't feel natural. Puts me out of balance, so I'm not going to get the shape I want. So, left foot's outside the lathe stand. Handle down low. Find our cut. Move along. How about we go the other way then? See if we can spot a difference. Okay. Let's have a quick look, I think, up on, where should we go, Ben? Oh, I've got to come back just a little bit. I'm going to put it back on. I don't know if you get it on, on the here. Can you see the ripples in there? Look at this. This is gorgeous, isn't it? Adding texture. We did that the other week. Nice and smooth. This actually is a continuous spiral. So if you move the tool too quick or too fast and not give it a chance to do the cut effectively, you will end up with a spiral. Um, and it's weird and wonderful things that kind of get. Okay, back on with our blank for a minute. Not on there, I might look. Okay. Thought I'd made a dot, but let's have a quick look. Hmm. Suggested it was right, but might not be. Find my center. There we go with that. Okay, we can rough it down a bit more. Next thing I can do, I don't know how clear this is. Maybe there, nah, lots of gap. I can get my fingers now down between here. Close the gap down. Less leverage, less overhang makes it a bit safer. I'm going to go back to that spindle gouge again. So that large continental gouge from there. Now I've got two or three sizes of these. Let's do with the big one now. Just going to clean up this end. So I want to get rid of my spiral. Takes a bit of knocking over the top. I can come back, I can tilt the tool. Handle's nice and low again, so we're rusting the bevel. We can rest the bevel there. I can push there, bring the handle up. Bring it round, we can start to create a bit of curve. So I can quite a bit of effort in. Take quite a heavy cut. A massive big tool really to be using. Let's even get a nice fine cut in there. Major thing with this, got to be in line with where I'm cutting, so it needs to be supported in line with where I'm trying to cut. So, big one. These all vary. It's quite amazing. One, two, three. Three of those, okay. One, two, three, four, okay. Different sizes. So, I've got something probably quarter inch, half inch. Inch wide, big massive one, okay? We can do exactly the same with any of those. So I've gone down, smaller one, fingernail shape, 
Nice sharp edge. Coming round. I okay, so again. These are fraud section. What I could do. Roll a bead. Nice and easy with that. Now, advantage with a spindle gouge, I need to come up slightly with the tool rest. I want to get into here. And even better, possibly, with the continental ones, it's the fact I can get right on its side and get the point right down in that gap. So, if I'm rolling a bead and we want to bring the two together, we can get right down in between. If you go with a modern day spindle gouge, you can still get to there. Let's see if we can find it. Let's see if we can show you the differences. Let's just clean things down a bit. Okay. Ben's got his hand up, which means he's got a question. So let's do that before we switch the leg back on and look at the chisels then. Okay, Ben, what have you got, mate? Um, excuse me. I've got a question here from Robert. Um, he's asking, would you sharpen the continental spindle gouge um, the same way that you would sharpen a roughing gouge? Okay. Oh, roughing gouge, free, Ben. Okay. We've already said we've sharpened to a 45-degree angle. And the best way you can see that, if you hold the top of the tool, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it on here as clear, going slightly bigger gouge because you'll probably see more. If you put a line across the top of, and you're looking at the top, so your flute's here, your round, first of all, it's square across the front. It's ground to about a 45 degree angle. So actually, if you draw a line across here to the other side, where your point is and the other side, you want an equilateral triangle on that little corner. So literally, there, 45 degrees, okay? We're gonna go to that big base thing I bought in. That's the back, much longer bevel. This is probably got 30 degrees. Different shape, more of a curve front. So again, let's give you a comparison. And it's a good question. It's one of the reasons I want to do, because it doubles up a little bit. More of a curve across here. This is dead square. Very different bevel. Okay. So I tend to have a longer bevel angle, and traditionally they would have a longer bevel angle on a continental on. And it's the wrong way of phrasing it. Nowadays, they're known as a continental gouge. But really, they're a forward section gouge. So these are traditionally handmade. They're still made today the same way. Beaten out. You'll pay more money probably for this than you would a normal gouge, which we get all a modern gouge. Let's not use the word normal, okay? So these are quite nice. Yeah, you've got... And I, even actually on this one, I love the fact this has got a line down from here. I can feel how it's been contracted and hand-beaten, polished, everything else. Come on, Ben, what have you got? Um, so a question here from Frederick. He's asking, um, does the grind angle just dictate the angle of approach uh, to the work, or does it um, affect the finish? Okay. The hand where you're obviously having a bevel can affect where you can get to. So the ground edge can affect the handle's got to obviously be lower. I can move my handle as a pendulum to adjust the cut, no different than a skew. So I can use this the similar sort of way as you do with your skew stuff. Um, so I can bring it down. I can find our cut. I'm a bit high on my tool rest for this now, but we can come down to there. We can get a shaving. Now I'm resting the bevel in behind. Let's bring my handle up just a tiny bit. Compensate. Nice big tool. Find our cut. Okay. So my handle's back out of the way. Now, I don't need a lot of leverage for this. If I'm roughening down, my body stance changes a lot as well. I can come lower. I can even get, let's see, I don't know if I get into here with this one now. Come round, so I'll bring the handle up. A bit high with the tall rest, really, but we'll get in there. So I can run round and roll a bead with that. That's excessive. So, yes, you're kind of right, but the bevel angle is actually giving us support and giving us cleans finish that polished area same with a skew okay obviously we can do our curve come and try a curve with these so this will be fun so i've gone back down to a little half inch one rest in the bevel i can make contact with the good bevel bring the handle up bring it in we can use the side 
But the problem I've got with the side, and it's like anything, just trying to see. I'm just looking at the camera for you here. You bring the side in here. Do you bet you're sat? And I've got the tool at the moment. Dev level on the tool rest. Not got any roll on the handle, so I'm level. If you bring the side wing in, there's a fingernail shape. It wants to roll it because there's no support. So the fulcrum point's rolling it to that point. So you've got to actually try and support it underneath where it is. But that's with any gouge, okay? So I can come into there. I've got my handle low. I can bring the chip up by bringing the handle up. Come into there. Go to three, uh, two for me, Ben. Just a second, okay? So if I bring my handle low, down here. My body's out the way again, Give me access to here. If I'm too far in front of the lathe, I'm blocking the handles. Spindle tool handles are shorter, and they are designed to be here. But help yourself as much as you can. So my left foot's right outside, handle's low, I can come up, find my cart, go to there, go on the side, come round. Other way, same thing, rest the barrel, find our cart, roll the flute a little bit, we can come in. So we can create our hollow. No different than a different gauge, all right? So this is looking more at history as well as anything. Come on then, Ben. Um, so a question from Fuller. He's asking, do you prefer um, a grinding wheel or like a linishing belt, a, a belt-type grinder? Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is one of these questions that me and Quelling regularly get. We do old marriage. We do bench grinders. We do Tormex. We do... What do I sharpen on? Um, Ultimate Edge is fantastic. I do love it, but it's new to me. I've started turning when I was 12 years old. I had a bench grinder. I've learned to sharpen everything freehand on a bench grinder. I'm not going to change just because of, but there are certain things actually where we've done Ultimate Edge stuff in here and I've got to play and gone, oh, wow. Right? With my turning tools, to in fact, I've always had a hollow grind. I've kept a hollow grind, haven't gone to a flat as yet. There are certain things I do want to play with. I want to look at things like the skew chisel. Is it more functional with a hollow grind? Can it be better or a flat grind can be better? You need to have a play. But I've always had my hollow grind, so it does make it difficult to say. On some of my gouges, I will have a secondary bevel in underneath, behind it. Okay, so that can change it. That can shorten the length of that bevel as well. Um, ben just trying to... Have a look on here. I don't know if you can see on here. So I've got my main angle down through. I've taken the corner back on this a little bit. That allows more access, especially on a hollow curve like we're just doing. Okay. Now, leave them on there a minute, Ben. Just, okay. So to answer your question on there, at the moment, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I like, like my round wheel. I will use a diamond file to, all right, the ultimate edge. And there's a sorby type of thing as well. They put a flat. I know lots of people that use them. So different ways of sharpening. No, you know, different ways of getting to that end result. Two different tools. Continental, been around for a long time. What most of us tend to go and buy now tend to be round section bar, a mill of fluting. So they, in other words, they have a round wheel. They put it in a machine. It goes back and forwards, and they mill that flute out. Now, this is a spindle gouge, okay? Has similar hollow. I don't know how well you can see this on the camera. Okay. Hollow section to the continental one, which is over here. Similar sort of flute depth, similar sort of shape. I've got a slightly longer fingernail shape on here because I want to come all the way round. I can get right down into here. I can get my bevel in. Being impatient in the bottom, clear it out. Now, the advantage I will say maybe with your modern day, your round bar, it's easier to roll across that width because it's round. Whereas your continental, you've got to get the cut in the right location for support. Whereas a round bar can be more user friendly. Why did they ever go round bar? Cheaper and easier to make. Traditionally, you've got to remember this would have started. Your Continental started off as a block of steel. You heat it, bang it, beat it, get your shape. Modern day techniques means you go and buy round bar, you cut it to limps, mill of fluting, sharpen it, put a handle on, done. Cheaper to manufacture, quicker and easier, okay? So the advent of mass production, maybe. Okay. So we've said about roughening gouge, 
uh, continental garages. And like I say, I've got three or four in here. Spindle garages, round ones. Let's give you a comparison to the large continental. My smallest spindle gouge, I have small quarter inch one. I use it loads. So that's my drill for down the middle of the boxes for a depth. Also, my detail on my little beads and finials for the box lids. So important to me, that little quarter inch gouge. Okay. So that's quarter inch diameter as in measuring the bar. Okay. So spindle gouges, they tend to measure. And this is in the UK. The guys in the States, I'm sorry, it's different again. You, you know that. Okay. So quarter inch over here all right, is around there. Okay. So my bigger one, I think this is half inch. All right. My two spindle gouges that I own. Only two I've ever had up until accumulating this, this collection over here. Okay. So a bit of spindle gouge. What do we know about a bowl gouge? Okay. Let's bring things back a little bit. Going to move things around a bit. Going to take the centres out of the lathe. Just make it a bit safer. Bowl gouge. And again, a little bit of a history lesson. Um, let's have a look, I think, then on two. Let's see if I get... Oh, look at that. Look, look. Can you see that section? Let's turn it around. It's a beast of a tool, isn't it? Okay. Um, so, down here, square, fitted. Okay. Round bar up through with a half round. Much thicker section than we've got. And let's compare that to the spindle wrapping gouge we showed you. Because people go, same thing. Nah. Very thin on the spindle wrapping gouge. Thinner section, wall steel, a thickness. So quite thin here. This is good. Quarter inch thick. Constant U-shape up through the middle. Okay. Up through the flute. And again, quite difficult to show. You can see your flute down through here. Comes all the way up. Okay. Um, again... Quite long tool. I'd probably want to put a, a bigger handle, a longer handle. This is a traditional bowl gouge. Um, it has, and I put, tried to put a traditional grind back on it, which tends to be very square. All right. So when I started turning, this was the norm. You had a square gouge. I know a few mates that still very much use traditional grind. Okay. This has a U-shaped section down through, and that's all relevant. Okay. So you get your U-shape. Different bell gouges, and again, as things developed, so I would go with something quite big, more modern gouge, round section bar. Again, it's that same thing. It's not being hand-beaten to the forge that shape, beaten out to create the hollow. This is starting as a round bar, and then they mill a flute into this. A lot more common, and for me, a lot more user-friendly. The other thing you can do is obviously change the shape of what you have on the tip. To go look at in a second. Okay. The flute wise, you get three different flutes. All right. If you go look at a gouge, and they all have their benefits. Again, you can easily Google this. Traditionally, the most common was a U shape, even like my big gouge. Then they have something more of a V shape. I think is that okay again you can probably say okay get a bit of a v shape section down through there then you get a parabolic one which is a combination of the two now do i have i don't think we've got that'll be the same if that's crown mm, not quite all right so the parabolic one is a combination of the two shapes they each have their benefit. For the traditional grind, the U shape is the easiest to sharpen for that. For a fingernail shape like we've got in here, you want something more of a V shape section. That can be good. All right. If you want something with longer wings ground back, more like an Ellsworth gouge, they used a parabolic one. Okay. And it's different grinding wheels that they're using to grind this out with. Next thing that plays a real part in it, and we've already hit it slightly, and I'm not going to get too much into it, but let me just do this and then we'll do you. This is new gouge out of the thing. I think, Ben, let's just pop me up to three. Good. All right, brand new gouge out the packet. It comes with a factory grind. Okay. Now, the problem with having a factory grind, 
you get it. If you don't know how to sharpen, what do I do with it? You need to learn to sharpen. That's a sad way. Why do they put a factory grind on? So, Ben, can we have a look at the picture before you do your question with the four bowls on it? Okay. Which was the first one we bought up. Oh, man. I know it takes a bit of swapping around. Okay, guys. So, Ben's brought that picture up. This is uh, something that our master of Turner did, a guy called Alan Batty. He was a god. Now, if you have a look at there, the, the picture in number one, right up in the top corner, left-hand side, more open bowl shape. You can have a different bevel angle on the back because you've got that access to get in there. Number two, the bowls are getting slightly steeper, coming up more encased around the side. Right? Number three, again, much deeper bowl. If you have a too shallower angle, you're never going to cut the bottom and never going to get into there. And as you go into number four, different angle again, up to 60 degrees. So you can change the angle depending really on what the bowl shape is. And that's such an important part because people say, what angle do I want? What bowl are you making? How big is it? What are you doing? How deep is it? So I might even have to have a bowl gouge where I go over and go, might have to change it. Good ways of adapting that. I think, Ben, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Right. In here, we have some double-ended gouges. Um, I occasionally travel, so a few of the guys that I've watched in this afternoon, Bob P or Vouch for, I've been to the States and done stuff with them. This has, I have lots of double-ended gouges because I can sharpen both ends. I've got more life out of my gouge, okay? I can put my handle on. Okay, then. I can have longer bevel on this edge, 55 degrees, swept back wing, which is more universal to use. On the other hand, I have a square grind, more traditional, which is, allows me to clean into the bottom of the bowl because I can hold it very square and come across the bottom section. All right, so different gouges do have different uses, and it's a bit of a minefield when you start to know what you sharpen them to. Right then, Ben. Okay, let's do your question, because you had your hand up before I went from the picture, now I feel guilty. Um, so a question from Frederick here, Jason. Um, he says that on his favourite bowl gouge, the flute only goes along three quarters of the, um, of the okay. bowl gouge. Right. Why is that? It's not a bad thing. Okay. Um, it's not a bad thing. I, I actually quite like, and I do have, I can show you comparative things, okay? Let's go comparative size to start with. Two gouges. We sell. Crown one, an Axminster branded one. The flute on the black one comes down to where my finger is, to the silver, coming right down to here, extra two inches longer. So simple thing. The longer this is to flute, the more time it takes to machine. All right, because you have, I haven't got, I'm gonna get, it's a bit big, but it'll show you. In reality, they have their wheel and it has to go into there and go up and down as a grinder on a mill. So it mills the length of the flute out. The further it has to travel, the more it has to actually remove, the more time it takes, the more it bluntens the cutter. So it all adds up on time. But benefit of having something with a shorter flute section, you get less vibration, less chatter, more strength. Okay, so when actually I do my boxes, I, my favorite gauge I have here, which we'll get to. So don't go thinking it's it's a bad thing, Frederick. It's actually really a way of obviously how they made it. It will cut costs. Be interesting to know why is it your favourite gauge? Does it make less chatter and noise when it's cutting? Less vibration because the more you, length you have in the flute, the more vibration you'll get a little bit. Maybe going back to my double-ended gouge. That's one of the reasons I love those. The flute isn't as long as I get on a normal bowl gouge. But due to the fact I have two sections, I'm actually getting more material length that I can use than an overall gouge. I can also have different setups either end. So that's a real benefit. Okay. So. I'm doing a little bit of spindle work. Okay. Let's do, and I'm going to put, let's do this one first. Because this relates partly to the question and to the query we have. We had a guy who... I've got a block of wood, and I'm going to mount it on my life. 
apart from I've now put it on here with the grain going the wrong way. We're not spindle work, we're actually going face plate work in reality. So my grain direction is running here. Okay, forward and back. Um, okay, that's locked in there. Tool wrist, I'm going to get in position, check it square. What do we cut this with? Oh, okay. An approach to this is going to make all the difference. All right. This thing, do you bet it's a square block? I'll go, I'll go with my, my spindle gouge or my spindle roughening gouge. That'll work, won't it? Okay. An approach can be everything with this. Um, I don't know if I want to do this, but um, I'm going to just going to do this because I discussed this with Ben earlier. Okay. I'm going to just put my visor on. Okay. I've taken the speed down. We can gently come up. Do you still get sound burn? Okay, good. I'm just trying to make sure I haven't cut you out. A little bit more speed will help me. First of all, if I come in wrong and I've got the feet flute too high, so my handle's nice and high. If you look on free, expect in a sec as well. I'll bring this in. What I'm hoping has happened, get this effect. Can you see that on the camera? All right, let's just flip the visor up. Now, the reason I put the visor on was exactly this. You get this breakout up on here and here. Because what's happening, you're coming around, there's no supporting grain. It's going to rip it apart. We'll do a little bit more. This time, I'm going to take my handle down low. Find our bevel. You're still not going to solve it. It doesn't like this. This is a no-no, really, to use. Lots of breakout. Not a clean edge. Will not do it nicely. So that is a chisel to do what we do for, if you like, faceplate work. Your spindle roughening out is not designed for that. Bad one to do. It will break out the top edges. There's no support. So you're going to go, I should use a bowl gouge then. Okay. And again, this is going to relate a little bit to how you approach it. Okay. So Ben, can we have a look on two for me? Now, if I bring the gouge in, and most people are going to do this, I'm going to keep the visor on just for a second. I'm going to bring the handle up a little bit high. I'm going to stand in front of the lathe. I'm going to do this. Okay. Lots of breakout. Now, I'm going to lose my visor now. Doesn't interfere with the mic because I know what I'm going to do now. It's going to work nicely. But lots of breakout on here. Got the handle too high. I'm not resting the bevel. All those things are going to cause problems. So my approach on this, first thing, I've got to get in a position that I can move the tool from headstock in towards the tail stop without anything interfering. I'm actually going to turn my body, though, so I'm now directly in front of the lathe. Feet spread apart. So I put the camera where I have for you today. Try and give you an indication of where your feet go. Handle, put down nice and low. All right, coming down towards my leg. Flute wise, I've got the flute directly facing me at the moment, but I can roll it. Now, this gauge, we've got a 55 degree bevel on a fingernail shape, long shape. Even with my gouges at home, now I sharpen Tormek. Be it on the bench grinder or on the Tormek grinder, I've got the Tormek jig that fits on there. BGK 100, I think it is. All right, there is a kit that fits on. Fantastic. Makes it repeatable. Why do I use that? After 35 years of turning, I can sharpen freehand. That's quicker, easier, cost-effective, saves material, saves me time. Takes the guesswork out of it. I've become lazy. But it makes my life easy. So in here, we've got our flute dead up right. Handle down low. When I bring it on, rest in the bubble. I can roll my right wrist on my handle, roll it over, find our shaving. I can now, and I've deliberately come in, so I'm about an inch in from the end on the left-hand side. So roll over, find our cut. Going to come back, swept it right off to where the headstock end is. Come along. Now, the other nice thing with this, the shavings actually go away from me. They go down on the floor. I'm not eating them, I'm more controlled. Bring my hand up, compensate, losing the cut. Come all the way along. 
Now it'd be nice too, but I'm letting this up. But this means I can keep talking to you about the visor. And the minute I go back to this, the shavings are coming up at you. So I can use that long wing, even for what we're doing now. I can even use that for spindle work. So if I travel, I don't take a spindle roughening gouge. But look how clean we are where the breakout points are. Nice clean here. This is the short grain fibers. We're not getting this mess flaring up. So that approach with the tool, even though it might be classed as, and that's actually the right tool to use, is so important. If you approach it wrong, you're too high with your handle, you're not resting the bevel, you're not getting support behind it. It's just going to bite the shavings off quite aggressively as well. Difficult to control. So this is all about, in reality, trying to give you, get rid of this, this breakout. Okay, quick change up then. Do a little bit of face plate work. Do tail stop quick. I will leave that for a sec. Might want it. That's the chuck is on the wall. That's on. A bit of sycamore. We put it on a screw chuck. Bring that up. Okay. Tighten it. Going to use the tail stock just to add a little bit of support. So the ring center is really good for this. It won't go in too far. Just add a little bit of support onto the to rest we can bring in. We're using center stem in line with the work as near as I can get it. I don't want to be right out on the end. It will bounce and flex. Get that stem as near as we can. Turn the work over. Have a quick look. Back to our bowl gouge. We can do exactly the same as we've just done. So first thing I want to do is true this up. I've turned the speed down. Up, clean up that outside edge. So again, face the live, relax the handle so it drops down, make contact with the back of the gouge. I'm not touching yet, I'm not even trying to. I can roll it. Find my shaving so that little bit of roll gives me control. My left thumb pushes across, puts the shavings away from me, nice and safe. Come across again. If I take it off and I lose my angle, go back to square one. Make contact, rest the bevel. We're not round yet. I roll the flute nice and gently. To roll it, I'm rolling my right hand, if you like. You can see I can roll it on my hip. Have a our pat. Now we're also using just off the tip. And that fingernail shape is really where this is so more adaptable than the traditional grind. Bit more easy to use for different stages, different places. One more. Oh, now we're round, we can move the tool rest. How do I know I'm round without looking? Um, the shavings are getting longer, they were more constant. Just going to change the rust, slightly shorter, robust rust into the. Where can we get to that? On here now we can use the other side. So I want to make a cut here. Now with this, I'm not going to rest the bevel. I'm going to come up. We can use the left hand wing of it. Do a drag cut. So this is about using different areas of the gouge as much as anything else. A bit more speed. So we'll go up from 700. Nice punch of shaving. Quick to rough this out. I to build my shape. If I don't keep the roll going, so I brought the flute back up to me too much, it stops cutting. If I roll it over a little bit, there it is. And this is really just banging that shape out fast. Bulk removal. Nice. There you go. We've done all bulk. We can take the tail stock out of the way. Tail stock we left in place really to do a bit more support because we're using the screw chuck. If I wanted to do a foot for a chuck, where should we go? Out there, or to measure it a bit. I can use the point, create a flat. I want to clean this up. Now I've deliberately gone with large gouge using the tip now. I've gone with large gouge to do the bolt removal because it will do that heavy cut. Got that longer length, bit of power. 
we secured it with the tail stock as much as anything to do what we just said, secure it. Going to use the chip. We'll drive round now. Now my left hand is there for support. Let's just clean up. Gonna come up round. Let's have a quick look. Much cleaner. I kind of find this big gouge. Next thing I've got on the back of here, and I haven't taken it off yet, haven't softened this corner. So hollow grind off the bench grinder, nice square edge. Tends to dig in a little bit. If I go double ended, let's have a quick look. That's got that there. I'm gonna go right down to my favourite gals then. Come on then, Ben, what have you got? So we've got a couple of questions here, Jace. Uh -oh. Um <clears throat> the first one is from, from Martin. Um, and he's asking if there was one gouge um you could recommend as a general purpose um a gouge. To do everything? No. Okay. But you can double up a little bit. If you gave me the choice of, and I, I can sum this up in a few of you, Bob P, if you're out there, you can vouch for this. If I travel, I don't take a spindle roughing gouge. Because I can do what we did with the square block that we showed you with the corners chipping off with a bowl gouge. But I can do my bowl work with a bowl gouge. So if I do that, I can use this as my spindle roughening gouge. So a bowl gouge is more adaptable than a spindle roughening gouge, okay? So if you gave me the option of, okay, and that. Likewise, you will need different size bowl gouges to do different things. This is great for roughening out. I want to refine it. I'm going to go to a smaller gouge, okay? So different gouges do have usage. So think about that aspect of what you're buying. Next weird and wonderful thing while we're on about it, and we're thinking of buying tools, Let's go comparative size. If you can, I know this isn't always possible. Pick it up, feel it. Before you take it to your workshop, you decide you're going to keep it. If you bought it mail order, yes, you could return it. Okay, as long as you've not used it. But have a feel of how things feel in your hands. How are you going to hold it? If you're doing lots of bow work, yes, you need a longer handle, but you need more leverage to hold. You're going to do some of the things, even what I'm going to do in a minute, when I use my small gouge, which I do for my boxes and stuff, and this is a bowl gouge, as a refinement tool, I don't need that extra weight and long handle. So put it in your hands. How does it feel? How do handles vary? Does that try and give you a, a quote? Crown one down here, a bit longer, smaller width here. I love gripping this right up here. That feels balanced to me. This one... It's a bit heavier. So all that plays a part. So put it in your hand and have a feel before you go sort of saying, yeah, that's going to, okay, really worth doing, okay? Then another question. I'll just throw that down before it's filled down. It could be, okay. Yeah, so we've got um, another question from Fuller. Um, he's asking, uh, well, he can see that, um, that one tool can make lots of different cuts or different types of cuts. Um, but is can you think of an example where, you should never use one tool like and and fuller gives the example of perhaps um a, a roughing gouge um facing off a, a so bowl or we've something we've already kind of said a roughing gouge should never be used for bowl work face plate work at all okay keep your roughing gouge for your spindle work that's a definite thing your bowl work can double up or your bowl gouge can double up a little bit i have something that's a crossover between the two it's classed as a detail gouge Okay, detail gouge has round bar, and again, it's quite a modern thing. It has almost a spindle gouge type flute, okay, but not as deep as a bowl gouge. So actually, no, let's write that back. But it has a bowl gouge type flute, but more to the depth of a spindle gouge is probably the best way I can describe that to you. So a little bit there. The problem is by going less material out in the depth of the flute, you end up with more bevel in behind. A longer bevel is not always good especially for bowl work, especially for the inside of the bowl, okay? So, again, it's that kind of problem. And I don't know when you're new to this, what do I go buy? Definitely got to have a bowl gouge. And round section bar is so much easier to control. Fingernail shape, you'll pay more for it being pre-ground, but it takes the guesswork out when you start. But then you've got to be able to sharpen it long term, okay? 
spindle wrapping gown. It's easy to sharpen, but it has very basic uses and primary use. I can show you a few other things we can do with it. All right. Okay. Um, let's go around here on my bow gouge then. So this is quarter inch bow gouge. I've dropped right down from something as probably half inch down to a quarter. Fit that in there. Now your bow gouge, because it's really, you're going to say quarter inch. You said you had a quarter inch spindle gouge. This is why we're doing this, isn't it? Quarter inch spindle gouge is this little thing over here. Quarter inch bow gouge, slightly different sizes. It gets confusing. Quarter inch spindle gouge, they measure the diameter of the bar in the UK. On a bow gouge, they measure the width of the flute they put into it. Are you confused yet? Okay, Ben sat here laughing, but you know, it's uh, okay. So big half inch bow gouge we roughed out, we'll take the bulk out. Little quarter inch one. I can use, I can get right into here nice and close. So down the foot, I can find my cut too low. So let's on there. Now I want a platform, I can turn it round. Into there. Now I don't need lots of leverage to do the cut now. Got a bit apparent on there, where I'm holding. Left hand, we said, just there to hold it and support it. That's see if we can be... All right, now this is nice and sharp. I can drive up to my wall, find my cut. Flute's on its side at about 10 o'clock. I'm going to drive the tip round. This hand's right out here. The handle, my hand is right on the back of the handle. So this is nice and sharp. I like this gouge. It's nice and controllable. I can come back up. Normally, if I'm going to grip it, I'm up here. Finger and thumb, help position, drive it along. Come off the back, I've got to support it because the fibres will break out a little bit. Pick up our cut again. Don't need lots of weight behind this handle, so nice and light for that. Different things that vary. Refinement, wrap it out. Okay? So quite easy to do, to build and go through. We've got a shape, we've got a bit, yeah, we've got stuff we're going to do. What I'm trying to get you to understand is where different gouges have slightly different uses. So if you said to me, for a bowl at home, what do I do? Exactly what I've just done now. I've roughed it out, I'll build most of the shape, and then I might go down to my smaller gouge to refine it, iron it in, get to where I want. Right, okay. Ring drive. Look on there. Let's go that way round. Not on there. Bring this over. Just trying to centralise it. That will do. Check it all clear. That's good. Small quarter inch bow gouge we've just used. Kick the shavings about a minute. I'm going to work tail stock end, finger and thumb. Up here. Now, body stance is all apart for this. Now, my left foot's just inside the stand. Right foot's angled. In reality, I'm angling 45 degrees if you said to me, where's my body line? So we go over and bring that round. I've got room to start out wide with the handle. It's got to come into me, go round. Running at a distance there, I'm going to move my left foot back outside the lave stand now. So my knee will clear the lave stand down here. But my left foot's right outside the stand. That gives me movement in here. If I'm stood here, I've got nothing to go. We want to create a funnel. Flutes on its side about two o'clock. We can drive off the edge. Let it go, go, get the lathe going for us. So our bow gouge, we can double up and use the spindle it. 
One more from there. Take it out. We come round. Bring that round. That looks good. Gills now. I'm going to roll it on its side. We're going to come along. Turn this up. It's going to be nice and quick. Rest the bevel. Body stance has changed again. Now my weight now is on my right foot. I haven't changed where my feet are from that last description. But my weight on my right foot. I can rest the bevel. I want to be able to pull the handle in. Come back in line with the headstock. So the, the bevel is going to finish up with where the drive centre is. In reality, we're going to come round. So parallel to the end of the log almost. So we can try half around. Follow. We're going to go follow in here. Rust the bevel. Up with the handle. Come into there. So working larger to smaller. We're using the right hand wind. Just off centre. My body stance is the same though. I can lean forward, put my weight on my right foot. Back to my left foot. Take a bit more material up there. Gently lean. That's into there. Good. Okay, then. Let me just do. So from here, I want to tidy up in under this bit. The easiest way of doing that is why we put the ring centers on. We're just going to turn it round. Check where it runs. Slightly off. Okay, all right, let's have your question, Ben, go on. Um, so we've got a question here from Pinocchio. Um, he wants to know a bit about the types of steel, like uh, M2, M42, oh the powder. How long have we got? Like <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, different things I came in with here, and it, it, it was quite exciting for me when I kind of got these. So high carbon steel, and different manufacturers have always done things. Uh, so this is Sorby probably 45 years ago, this is this is high carbon steel. It will give a very bright coloured spark. It's softer, it won't hold its edge as well as modern day steels. From then things went to high speed steel, okay? Much harder wearing, so you can sharpen it to a good edge, it'll hold its edge nicely. Most of my, no, all my training tools, apart from the things we've just bought in today, are high speed steel, all right? The most common thing that's out there then there's been a whole fluctuation in the last 10 or 12 years, definitely, of different things. I can give you a pro PM steel that's crowded. That's really nice. That's a high scintillated particle thing. So almost like a tungsten, but very different. Right? So it holds its edge really nice. But okay. M42, got different things like that. So you can pay your money, take your choice a little bit. High speed steel will do most of us what we want to do. Okay. You can sharpen it easy on a normal bench grinder with a white wheel. That's important, so you don't overheat it. Go light with your pressure. Get yourself something as a sharpening jig. It's a paramount. CBM wheels will do it. Diamond wheels won't. And there's a difference there, okay? So if you look at buying a CBM or a diamond wheel, and again, it's something I'm thinking of doing a session on, a diamond wheel is not good for high-speed steel. CBM is. It's how they're manufactured and what it is, a particle. Um, then you get into things like M42 and everything else. Again, you need to check what you're going to sharpen it on. Tour make diamond wheels will work, that sort of thing, right? So they're on a whole load of different steels. But in reality, what they're trying to do is make something harder, more wear resistant. From if you make steels harder, you can tend to make them more brittle. So it's getting that balance right, okay? Hoping that does a bit, Ben. If not, we could be here for a couple of weeks doing that one. Okay, so we turned our, our funny thing round. So we've got access now, because I'm naturally right-handed. Um, I, I can't, I can do it. Most of us can't easily. This allows me to use my bow gouge in here, okay? To get in that cut. So I want to clean that up. Again, we're back on with the speed. We're bringing this in. we we'll cut it, okay? Nice thing with the ring centers. If I engage the flute, now I've got the flute when I'm cutting, probably about two o'clock. 
catching just off centre. If I bring the flute too high, you get that, that top wing, it'll bite. So you get this thing called resistance. Now, the ring centres act like a clutch. Right? So we're not spinning when we make contact. I need to try it back up again now. Then if I get it wrong, it'll tell me I'm doing it wrong. Rebut it in. If I use the tip correctly, it'll cut. Now, the other good thing with the ring centres, should be some there soon. I hope one more taper. So I'm hoping they're back in stock. Real important bit tip. So you can see here now I've gone down with my body. I'm stood more in line with the leg. I think we're on three. I think that's where I'm walk back and forward and you see my feet get to here. More in line. My handle is coming diagonally away from I'm about 45 degree across the laid back. I need to go from where I'm there. Flutes on its side, two o'clock. I can push forward gently with my thumb. I can swing my body weight from my right foot to my left foot to blend in. Same again. Other thing that's useful when I get to the bottom here, I roll my wrist. So the flute becomes more upright. We're going to come down. Blend this in. Take a little bit. Blend together. Okay. Change there, I love that. So, a little bit more. So this is bowl gouge. Right. Now, if you think about what we've just done, a few things to trim off it. We can do our little sanding, just whatever else. We need to sand it, polish it. The art of the wooden mushroom. Okay. So why have we thrown it into this? Because one tool, one small bowl gouge, quarter inch, great practice piece. Direction, feed, how you roll the flute, different areas of using it with the wings, quite an important little part. All right. Um, tend to be my sort of warm-up exercise. We go do club demos and stuff. Weird thing, just to get things, get them to understand that you can do a lot with one tool. All right. So I can move things about. Handle movement's so important. You've got to, got to swing. And that's one of the other biggest things that people don't always realise when they're new to turning. Not just a case of pushing this in. You've got to think of where your body's going to go to get your handle back round or round. Right? Likewise, definitely on the inside of a bowl. Okay? So, hopefully. I think Ben's got a few more questions. Let's go to Ben then. Um, so a quick question here from Nigel. Um, he's got one of these Sorby Pro Edge linishers, okay, yep. and um, he has a diamond belt on it. Yep. He's asking, were you saying that no nope, diamond that that's designed for that? Okay. On CBN type wheels, so a bench grinder wheel. I can see where you're heading with this. I'm digging myself a hole. CBN type wheels, which is a round wheel. So if you looked on our website, we do a CBN wheel that fits on a bench grinder. You get different types. A few years back, they were pushing diamond wheels. Now, the problem is the diamond wheel doesn't like high-speed steel, so the particles tend to clog the wheel more. Okay, so you're better off looking at right, what works. A CBM wheel, which is a carbon borer nitrate wheel, which is harder than diamond, which sounds unusual, doesn't it? Right? And it's chemically grown, from what I understand, or laboratory grown, is better for high-speed steel. So that's really what I'm looking at there. You will have a diamond belt that will fit on your head. That won't hurt because actually that's designed to clog or relieve those clogged particles. If it's the belt I'm kind of thinking of, it's even got like a cross hatching from memory. Okay. So that will stop anything clogging. So don't go getting worried about that. No, it'll work. All right. Oh my God. What have I done? Right. Okay, Ben. How you doing? We all done up to there? Right then, guys. Hopefully. As you were saying, little mushrooms, such a simple thing. Different gouges, gouges do have different uses. Your spindle roughening gouge, try and keep it purely for your spindle work between centres. I can even shape with it a little bit. Rapid stock removal, it will work. Don't go thinking you can't. Um, chair legs in here, when we used to make winter chairs, I will take most of the bulk out. Definitely with a roughening gouge, so much easier. I'm not a great skew fanatic, so therefore I can even use it a bit like a skew if you like. I can... We haven't covered that as far as we could hold it 45 degree angle. I can rest the bevel, push it in. That can like a spindle wrapping gouge. You know, instead of being square, we're coming down, take for it. 
really good. Okay, but you've got to rest the bevel. And that goes back, I suppose, a little bit to when we started today. Things need to be sharp. Okay. Um, be nice to know if you've got if you've enjoyed watching this. Okay. If you've got queries on that bit, if you've got problems with sharpening, like I said, today's video was all about in reality, one guy coming and saying, I've tried turning a block of wood. He sent us some pictures, and I went, but the wood grain's going the wrong way for what you're approaching it with with a chisel. Could make a good video. So if you've got ideas on things like that or problems with your sharpening or that's no, we're trying to sort them out. We're trying to help. Um, they, these videos take a little bit of putting together. We, we do sort of try and aim to fulfill different things. So then we're back in next week, aren't we? So we will see you next week. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much, guys. Bye.